And did you know that you just ate your nutritional herbs? Lee is here to teach us about the, the mind-body-brain function um, along with a spiritual connection. He's also a master herbalist. So there's two different types of herbs that we have, nutritional and medicinal. So this afternoon, Lee will be talking about nutritional herbs. Tomorrow will be more of the um, medicinal herbs. So if you do have an ailment, we can come back in line with those health principles that we stepped away from that he talked about the rumble strips on either side of the road. Those 12 health principles are our guideposts, like his commandments are our guideposts. So I just, I wanted to say that there's no, you're not here by accident. You've all been led by the Holy Spirit. What you're gonna learn for the rest of the seminar is really gonna open your mind at how beautiful God is, how simple his remedies are, and they're in your backyard. And I wanted to share this with you because this just happened yesterday. So I'm an herbalist, not to the caliber of Lee, but I dabble in it here and there. I teach classes here and there. But I had an email. We have property in Colorado, Salida, Colorado. It's in a 1,300-acre development. We own a couple parcels in there. We got this email that says, according to the Colorado legislature, they will be having a company come in and pray, spray for noxious weeds. And I'm like, well, that's always good news to hear, right? Their noxious weeds are common mullein and Canada thistle. So some of you that know herbs are knowing that mullein is the herb of choice to heal lungs, to keep things moist, right? And mullein is a great tonic of liver, uh, kidney supporter. We are destroying the world and they are looking to take down things that are simple and in our own yard. It's you guys today that Lee mentioned earlier with the three angels message, we have a work to do. You're here learning and you're gonna go share it with somebody else. It starts with that step. Your meal today, was it 100% vegan or mostly? 100% vegan. Did a little bit of cheese maybe. But you didn't miss any flavor from that great a meal. We were designed to be plant-based. And that's what Lee will be talking about earlier. But I want to pray for him, for all of you, and for who you're going to go out and reach. So let's take a moment and bow our heads. Glorious Heavenly Father, again, you are the king of the universe, the omnipotent one that created us, that has a plan for each and every soul that's here and Father, for every soul that they will reach. So we ask that the Holy Spirit fill us up, fortify us, guide us in love and compassion as Jesus is our example. I ask a special blessing on Lee and Amy and Jonathan and Emily as they go about serving you in a mighty stronger way, reaching people across the world, or across the United States with this simple message of health attainable Father, bless this congregation, bless us all according to your will, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good afternoon. This uh, is this working? Is it working back there? <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. I can't hear. No. Or shall I speak in there? Oh, th that may help. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that little technical detail. There we go. There we yeah. Go. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yes, you have to be a scientist nowadays figure out these things all right well I uh, hope you had a good lunch I certainly did thank you for everyone who provided that meal for us it was a blessing um, so we'll be uh, continuing uh, discussion on um, on health and this time we'll be looking at nutrition uh, please come back tomorrow for the botanicals we'll be looking at uh, some of the herbs of the field that have powerful effects upon us physiologically. So 
Um, today we're going to be covering more the dietary aspects, and you know I don't think we can ever improve on what God has given. Um, man has repeatedly tried and failed, and I think there's a reason for that. Is because um, when He makes something, He makes it perfect. When we try to make something, it's always less than what it would have would have been done if God had designed it himself and because he was the designer of all the foods that we so graciously partake of um, it's a, it's a very sad to me that we are seeing a degradation of the food chain uh, very rapidly uh, before our eyes and I'll go into that more as we go on but Genesis chapter 1 verse 29 uh, is a beautiful uh, verse to me, it says, God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And we know when God made everything in the beginning, it was without decay, it was without disease, uh, deformity, and death. And Satan came along with another plan, didn't he? And he said, if you eat this fruit, you will live forever like me. Yeah. Uh, how did that work out? Not <laughs> very well. Right? He had the seeds of death in there. I'm sure it looked beautiful. I'm sure it, it, it wasn't some disgusting plant. Uh, but at the same time, it had incredible ramifications to that. And I think sometimes... Uh, the devil tries to package food in such a way that it makes us feel uh, that we are missing out if we don't partake of it. Uh, you know, the Bible says, uh, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatever ye do, do all to the glory of God. The Bible also says in Isaiah 4 verse 6, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. And it's not that we don't have enough knowledge, right? In fact, they're saying that knowledge is doubling every five years. Uh, and it's exponential. And uh, we have so much knowledge. We have probably too much in some areas, right? Um, I've, uh, I've been uh, familiar a little bit with the AI systems. Um, you know, like chat, GTP, and everything. And it's interesting, I went on there recently to find some research, and um, I felt like I was listening to a commercial. <laughs> I got some of the results back. Um, we have a suppression of vital information, and we have a deluge of false information. And that's just getting more and more. And uh, very few places you see it more than when it comes to health. Uh, and when you go on the web, you'll find there's, there's so-called scientific evidence to uh, validate just about anything you want to eat, right? I mean, you can find so-called evidence to eat lizards or, or cockroaches or... Um, I don't know, you know, snake's blood and all kinds of things out there. And you can find all kinds of knowledge against eating things that God has given. There is uh, some scientific evidence against using garlic. Uh, there's uh, evidence against, uh, so-called evidence against uh, eating vegetables, eating fruits and everything. So how do we discern between what is good knowledge, what is saving knowledge, and what is bad knowledge, what is false information. How do we discern that? How do we even know how we can test that? All right, well, I'll tell you how I, I work, okay? I test uh, scientific knowledge through inspiration. This is my lens where I filter, um, and, you know, I, I wholly encourage people to do that because the Bible says that um, 
there is a science falsely so called it says that in Timothy in book of Timothy chapter six, first Timothy chapter 6 there is a science that will advocate and God is the God of science right he's the one that created science so science true science should not conflict with uh, what God has said those two actually will harmonize but many scientists will disagree right and um, I remember a, a doctor uh, once saying when he went to medical school that uh, he was told 50% uh, of what you learn today uh, is false. Uh, the problem is we don't know which 50%. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, with, with God, he has given us the blueprint. The, the scriptures give us a lot of information about diet. Uh, I, I don't actually like to use the word so much diet because diet implies a temporary uh, restriction on certain food items. And uh, I found that uh, diet implies in the mind that we can come off it. We can go on and come off for a certain time, whereas God wants us to have a permanent lifestyle change, right? Because uh, diets do not work. We have a rebound effect. doesn't matter what diet you have. It usually works on the principle of restricting and cal caloric restriction, okay? Especially caloric restriction. And you starve the body of other elements it needs and then you get to a point where you overindulge when you come off it and you end up putting back all the weight you lost and all the semen benefits that you gained uh, end up being thrown out to the wind. Um, don't use all your health to chase after wealth, only to spend all your wealth later to get back your health. All right. It seems to work this way in the United States, doesn't it? What is the biggest expenditure in America today, as far as industry goes? Anyone tell me? Healthcare. That's right. Yeah, sick care. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Shouldn't call it healthcare, should we? In fact, according to the AMA, uh, uh, the third leading cause of death in the United States is health care, right? Uh, actually, if you added it all up, all the statistics, it would actually be number one. But then if people knew that, they wouldn't go, would they, and spend all their money. So on average, 20% of every dollar in the United States gets put to health care or disease care. And how's that, how's that turning out for us? Not too well. Uh, are we getting healthier? We should be the healthiest nation in the, in the world today, shouldn't we? We should be, right? The uh, Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 17, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for gluttonous. Okay, so here's a principle here eat in due season and eating for strength not for gluttony do you know in, in the bible uh, gluttony was equated with uh, if someone had gluttony uh, it usually equated to drunkenness all right so it produces the sim same symptoms in the body so if you eat too much food to the point where you know the stomach is just totally full stomach should never be totally full by the way it's just like putting uh, clothes in a washing machine you need a little space there for it to turn around okay the stomach needs about 30 percent space to turn the food around to process it and to break it down so uh, gluttony is produced in the body as a res sh should I say drunkenness is produced in the body as a result of gluttony because it leads to fermentation which leads to what? Fermentation can lead to alcohol, yes, being formed, and that can lead to knocking out a chemical in the brain called GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, which is basically it's like knocking out the brakes on your car. Anyone like to drive without no brakes? Yeah, well, <laughs> so I'll put up a hand. <laughs> That's why they don't give teenagers the keys to the car when they're 14 years of age, right? <laughs> okay, yes. 
Um, so, so eating for strength, we're either living to eat or eating to live, right? And so we eat based on principle and not based on indulgence, right? That's, this is really important. The Bible says, Proverbs 23, 2, put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. I've never seen anyone do that, but um, <laughs> yeah, what it's saying here is it's pretty dangerous. Uh, when you see someone with a knife around the throat, it, it's a dangerous sin- scenario. So is if you be given to appetite. And when you go in the supermarkets today, this is typically what I see. Do you see the same thing as I'm seeing here? This is a typical American family shopping trolley, right? You see lots of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and nuts, and beans, and yeah. I don't typically see what we have in the lunch menu today in people's trolleys. Is it any wonder that we live in such a crazy world today? All right, average American has 2.7 servings of uh, fruit per day and vegetables combined, that is, fruits and vegetables, 2.7 servings, very, very small amount, when we really need about uh, upwards of 13 servings. So we're getting around 20%. 20 percent of what we need as far as fruits and vegetables go and really this should comprise a big part of our diet i saw a uh, chef he came from england and he came over to america to try to reform some of the eating habits in the schools and he was shocked that in the schools the children didn't know what a potato was they didn't know what a tomato was they didn't know what a broccoli was but they knew what a pizza was. They knew what a, a French fry was, okay? And, uh, you know, we're living in a society of total ignorance when it comes to diet, especially these are things we don't get taught, do we? Growing up, not in school, we, we don't get educated on the things that are the primary importance. Because if we did, it would starve these big food companies and these big food companies make billions of dollars from our ignorance. Uh, Do you know what is in your food? Do you read labels? Do you check the ingredients? It's a good idea to check your ingredients. Uh, I'm telling you, it it will shock you. Uh, You know, I remember I went into a store, you know, I, I used to like those fruit cocktails. You know the fruit cocktails with all the, you had the peaches, and the cherries, and the pears, and pineapple, and grapes. I used to love those. And I was reading one day, and I I looked up the coloring agent that was used in the cherries, and it came from ants, ants' blood. And I thought, what? Are you kidding me? (laughs) But it's a natural coloring, (laughs) right? Yeah, it's all natural. Aren't you thankful for that? I know some breathe a sigh of relief when you found it. All right, so check out what's in it. You don't have to be paranoid, but just look, if you keep a principle, just keep it simple, right? What's that saying? Keep it simple, stupid, right? Just keep things simple and try to get foods that you know are are as much, as as natural as possible, right? Uh, I know we can't always do that at times, but as close to the original as possible. Um, Unfortunately, we have genetically modified foods nowadays. Um, Now, thankfully, it's not in every food. In fact, uh, here's some major foods that it's in. Uh, The biggest ones are corn and soybeans uh, and also canola oil and wheat, those tend to be some of the most prominent, all right? But there are some others. Not every tomato is genetically modified. Not every papaya is genetically modified. Um, And this may vary depending on where you buy it from and whether it's bought locally or not. But uh, the problem is that once you genetically alter a food to make a, 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 a genetically resistant um, 
chemical makeup to, to basically throw Roundup so that Roundup doesn't kill the plant, but it produces these pesticide factories in your stomach, then how is that going to affect your gastrointestinal system long term? Uh, these are things that we we only have short term evidence for. There's there's really there's not many long term studies done on this, but we do know that a lot of these foods do have devastating effects, especially on the gastrointestinal system, the stomach, the small intestines, uh, even the bowel, the pancreas, the liver. Um, and they can affect fertility as well. And uh, I, I, I don't know about you, but I personally don't want to eat food that I know has been genetically manipulated because you don't know the ramifications of that. Remember, cancer is a result of DNA that has been sabotaged, right? It has basically changed the blueprint of the cell the law of the cell has changed. And you're changing the code, the DNA of the plant. And we think that that's gonna have no effect upon our body. I don't think so. Um, look, uh, as, as much as possible, I know it's not the case for everyone, and we don't al uh, always buy organic food. There are some food that uh, is just very hard to get a hold of organically. Uh, we do try to grow. Uh, own food, so we uh, we're coming to the end of our vegetable harvest. Uh, we've had a lot of cabbage, and we grow our own tomatoes and and cucumbers and uh, broccoli and cauliflower and spinach, all all kinds of things. Not spinach, kale. And uh, we've had an abundant harvest this year. It's been absolutely wonderful. It's it's nice to grow your own food, and and cut it and cook it and uh, know it is from the ground, <laughs> that you planted that seed. Uh, it's so rewarding. I think a lot of the reasons that we are suffering so much disease is be because we're not getting the nutritional value from our food that we used to. And uh, case in point, I have a refractometer that I can test the food density of, nu of nu nutritional food density in plants. And let me tell you, uh, I've rarely ever come across a food, even organic food that you buy from the store, that has adequate nutritional density in it. Um, very, very limited. In fact, uh, just a case in point, tomatoes. I got some tomatoes, and they were actually organic tomatoes. And they should have been on my scale around 10, but they were down to one. All right, so somehow along the way, they didn't get very much nutrition. Um, so. I know everyone's in different situations, but even if you can grow just a few percent of what you eat, it's worth doing. I mean, there are a lot of benefits to that. There's a lot of exercise and, and getting outdoors in the fresh air. There are uh, immune enhancers that are actually in the soil that when they get under the nails can actually give you a stronger immune system. Um, and plus, it's drawing us closer to God and it's giving us uh, a lot of the sunlight, fresh air, and exercise that the body needs. So imagine if God had given us just one color food. Wouldn't that be pretty boring? But he gave us multiple colors. I love it when food is presented in a way. You know, we eat with our eyes, don't we? <laughs> yeah. yeah, some eat, have big eyes than others. <laughs> okay. But uh, the color, is it, it, it's, what, it, what, it's what creates in us that appetite as well, right? And you see the beauty of it. Um, and be creative. You know, if you're going to spend a lot of time preparing, put it more into, um, you know, making it a nice arrangement. You know, putting it in the plate. Make, spend a little time being creative. And it will make it more enjoyable, more palatable, and everyone will thank you for it. Uh, so just as a general rule, this is not hard and fast, but if you could have half of your food as fruits and vegetables a day, um, your chance of getting cancer is very, very small. All right. Because there are phytochemicals in those foods in particular that help protect us against cancer. You know, we have cancer cells in us all the time. We have thousands of cells every day 
that could develop into full-blown cancer. So why don't we get cancer? Why don't we all have cancer? Do you know there are little enzymes that go up and down the DNA called editase? They're like uh, editors looking for typing mistakes in books. And when they find a mistake, they notify scissor enzymes, they come along, splice out the DNA, gets put back together, you know nothing about it, goes on while you sleep, and it protects you against cancer. It's happening all the time. So we have corrective measurements in the body that are actually causing the body to resist the effects of mutations from things that we eat. And in fruits and vegetables, they carry the nutritional elements to keep those processes going, to keep the editase working, to keep scissor enzymes operating, to, to help the immune uh, system be the most optimum it can be. And they got lots of phytochemicals in there, many of which we don't even know the science behind how they work. Uh, but they have protective abilities on us, upon us to resist the effects of cancer. Now with cancer, you need to have a, uh, you, you need to have one foot on the accelerator and one foot off the brake. Now what do I mean by that? I mean that you can eat bad food, right? That could be a foot on the accelerator. But if you have a good attitude, like I mentioned last night, the cancer genes may not be activated. Yeah, because you have one foot on the brake because of your mind. It's suppressing cancer development. Yes, that's why some people have a healthy mind and eat rubbish food, but don't get sick very often. Okay, and then you have other people. Anyone heard of orthorexia? Orthorexia, you've heard of anorexia. Okay, people starve themselves to death. Well, orthorexia, ortho, like orthopedic, it means straight. It's a Greek word for straight or correct. Ortho, orthodentist, straight teeth, <laughs> okay. All right, so orthorexia, it means you have an unhealthy obsession for right eating. That's what it means. An unhealthy obsession for right eating. Okay, so I have a l I've had a lot of people the last year or two that I've met with orthorexia. Yes. <laughs> And they are really obsessed with e eating correctly, okay? They eat correctly, but they have an incorrect attitude, which leads them to eating more uh, what they think is healthier, but actually is nutritionally deficient. So let me give you an example, okay? Um, I met a lady, she came to one of our training programs. She could only eat one or two foods at a meal, right? Very simple, like pumpkin. All right, she could eat pumpkin and maybe a, a side dish like a green. All right, and, and how it started, she uh, enrolled in some health training and she ended up getting worried about um, certain things that she couldn't eat. Like, like things that could be a problem, right? Like gluten, for example. There's about 5% of people that have gluten reactions. Okay, so she started restricting certain things and over time, it got more restrictive. And the things that she would normally eat, she couldn't even eat those. Whereas before, she didn't have a problem. Because when she came to the food, when she came to sit down before the plate, she had anxiety. If you think your food's gonna hurt you, it will. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, okay? So she started getting worried about the things she, she was eating, and then she got more, they had more reaction to her in, in, in intestinal tract and caused bloating, gas, and nausea, and cramping, all these things. And so she got more and more restrictive as a result of being restrictive because the restriction first took place in the mind 
and then it played out in her body until she got to a point she could only eat one or two foods. And then her daughter was on the same program. Her daughter was only six years of age. And then she couldn't eat with her husband because her husband eats everything. You know, and he, it wasn't unhealthy, but you know, he would eat a good variety of food. So she had to make a meal separate from his. And then she's got a son that eats differently as well. And so, so now she's got the stress of making all different meals for all different people. And she's at the point herself, she's wasting away, right? Um, orthorexia, it's really bad news. Now, in the Bible, when God told Eve, all these, you can partake of all these foods, all these trees, except one. The devil came along and said, has, has God not said you can eat all these things? You know, isn't, isn't there some restriction on your diet here? So he got Eve to focus on what she couldn't eat, not on what she could eat. You see the psychology? Focusing on what she couldn't eat. Now, there are certain things that you don't want to eat. I'm not saying we, we eat everything, okay? But within the parameters of what God has given, freely eat all things, right? Unless you've got some severe reaction or, or some, some reason, some good reason that you shouldn't eat it. And so the mind tends to get more concentrated with certain individuals that are susceptible to this on the restrictions than on the abundance. And as a result of that, you end up starving your body. So this is how it works. In the body, you have what's called an enteric nervous system. By weight, it's heavier than the nervous, uh, the spinal cord. It's a big, complex set of nerves that attach to the bowel. And for certain individuals, when you get anxious over the food, it actually causes the bowel to tighten. And that creates malabsorption. It affects the little villi that open up to allow food into the bloodstream. So you clamp down. Because your mind's clamped down, the body clamps down. Now for other people, it works the opposite. For some people, they get stressed over what they eat and it causes the, the a spasm effect that's actually opposite a constriction. It actually causes expansion and it allows undigested food particles in the bloodstream and it creates an autoimmune condition depending on the susceptibility of the mind. Okay, so you have the same cause but different effects depending upon your predisposition. All right, so you can have, I, I remember a gentleman I met, he was, he was about six feet tall he weighed 80 pounds. He was eating three pound meals three times a day. That's like twice what I eat. And it wasn't putting an ounce on his body. He looked like he came out of Auschwitz. All right, because his mind. So this is the power of the mind over the body, right? The body will sympathize with the state of the mind. So if you think your food's going to hurt you, that's why the Bible says when you eat, eat in faith. That means don't be anxious about eating it. It's going to hurt you otherwise. All right? So it's very, very important that you understand this principle because when the body sympathizes with the state of mind, then the body in turn affects the mind. It's a cyclical pattern. So the mind affects the body, the body in turn affects the mind because it feeds the body with the neurotransmitters that it needs to be able to, to send nerve conduction through the body. And you can have false transmitters, you can, you can have crazy thoughts actually as a result of what you eat. And it can set you up for an imbalanced mind even more than the imbalance that created the problem to start with. Does that make sense? Um, 
I see some of you are sad. <laughs> I don't know. Don't, don't all think I'm talking about you, okay? <laughs> all right. All right. You know, uh, medical students tend to get the diseases that they study. All right. I'm just, I'm just uh, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> all right. All right, so we, we, we're going to eat in, in good faith. When you eat your food, don't stress about it. If you're stressed about your food, it will tend to poison the stomach. So just, you know, relax. Actually, the food time should be the least stressful time. Talk about happy things around mealtime. Uh, don't be in a hurry. Chew your food well and enjoy. That's, that's what God gave it to us for, to enjoy. Um, High-fat diet rodent, rodent models have contributed significantly to the analysis of pathophysiology of the insulin res resistance syndrome. So I'm glad I'm not a lab rat. <laughs> I tell you, I'm glad I'm not working for the CDC as a lab rat. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, Animal fats are something the Bible does warn us against. All right, the the life is in the in the blood, the taste is in the fat. Actually, it's, it can be in the blood as well. But um, beware about that because the the remember the the life is in the blood. The word life means thoughts and feelings. The thoughts and feelings are transferred from the animal to human beings. Did you know that? It happens. Um, okay, now God designed us with a sweet tooth. I have a sweet tooth. I love sweet things. Yes, um, and I could. I used to be a sugar junkie. I would. I don't know. I'd eat lots of lots of chocolate. Anyone like chocolate? I used to eat tons of chocolate. Um, yeah, it, it was a it was a weak point. When I grew up, I never ate one healthy meal in the first 20 years of my life. I was on a junk food diet, just total junk. <laughs> Pizzas, burgers, fries, um, sugar galore. Uh, it's amazing I'm still alive. Uh, in a study published in uh, the uh, JAMA, which is the Journal of American Medical Association 2014, uh, Dr. Hu and his colleagues found an association between a high sugar diet and a greater risk of dying from heart disease. Over the course of 15 years study, people who got 17 to 20 percent, 21 percent of their calories from added sugar had a 38 percent higher risk of dying from cardiovascular disease compared with those who consumed 8 percent of their calories as added sugar. Um, now, we still have sugar, but we we have it primarily from fruits, from dried fruits. Sometimes we have coconut sugar, which is less refined. Uh, uh, my kids also love honey, probably eat too much honey. <laughs> if you're watching at home, <laughs> go easy on the honey. <laughs> they, love, they love honey. Um, but uh, unfortunately, most sugar is from refined sugar cane. They take one, one foot. Actually, now it's more genetically modified beets which has taken the place, I don't know which is worse, but uh, you take one, one foot of sugar to get one cube of sucrose. Now the problem is not the sucrose. We have an enzyme in the stomach called sucrase, breaks down sucrose. But the problem is what's left out, right? So you got all these other elements that are missing and we feed this to horses, we call it molasses, right? <laughs> So uh, usually when s things are refined, it's not that the item that is left over is bad, it's just it doesn't have all the other complementary phytochemistry there to balance it, right? And so uh, sugar becomes very, very toxic to the body, especially in large amounts. It is pro-inflammatory. It does promote cancer growth. It does promote cardiovascular disease. It does contribute to diabetes. So be very, very careful with sugar. It does end up on your hips as well. So be, be aware about that. A diet that includes c consuming a high amount of unhealthy and refined grains can be considered similar to consuming a diet containing 
a lot of unhealthy sugars and oils. And unfortunately, it's the same with wheat. It's the same with rice, right? That you take out the good stuff and you've left with very little. Like white flour, is, is pretty much no B vitamins left in there. It's, it's been stripped out. It's nutritional value, it's high amounts of carbohydrates. These carbohydrates are simple carbohydrates. They end up uh, elevating the blood sugar levels very quickly. They don't have any fiber. And um, ever you want to try this, um, you get, get, go to a grocery store, see a loaf of white bread and, and squish it like that. Yeah, I did this once in my side. I felt a little guilty after I left the store because I I didn't, wasn't able to get it back, <laughs> and I didn't buy it. <laughs> so, so don't do that. Don't follow my example there. <laughs> but if you get a whole whole loaf and you spring, it will just bounce right back, right? Because the the fiber is there to to help it. All right. So, uh, so that's what we need. You know, we get in North America less than about ten percent of what we need is fiber. It's incredible. We don't get enough fiber. So the average American takes two to three days before they have a bowel movement. Two to three days. Can you believe that? Yeah. You ever want to go and you just hang on a bit long and the urge goes away? What happened? <laughs> the body had to break that down ends up back in the portal vein, gets shot out into the bloodstream, and you end up with a migraine later that evening. All right, people are bathing in their own ways. I'm sorry, it's pretty bad, isn't it? I hate to, hate to <laughs> make this behind the pulpit up here, but this is the realities of life in modern America and much of the world. Um, <clears throat> Plant-based diets are associated with a low risk of incident Cardiovascular disease, cardi uh, sorry, why is that there twice? Mortality and all cause mortality in the general population of middle aged adults. This is from the Journal of American Heart so Association. So, plant based diets. This, I believe, is where God wants to put us. Okay. Now, uh, some people say, well, look, Jesus ate meat. He ate fish. He ate lamb. Okay, th this is true. He did. It was a common staple of the day. We, have you, have you uh, noticed that the seawater is not the same as it was 2,000 years ago? Yeah. Look, if the sea was as clear as it was 2,000 years ago, maybe I would be tempted to eat fish. I didn't like them looking back with those eyeballs. I just don't, didn't like that. But um, listen, there's two primary reasons that uh, meat eating was allowed. One, it shortened man's lifespan. And two, it was for emergency diet. And I would say, and add a third one, it was used in sacrificial services to typify Christ. All right, and so uh, this was the dividing line when, when they came to Jesus and said, uh, you know, um, tell us who, are you the Messiah? And Jesus said, you know, you need to eat my uh, flesh and drink my blood. And they were like, what? Eat your flesh and drink your blood? And he was saying, his word is flesh. You see, they didn't equate the spiritual application, right? And so uh, another time they came to Jesus and they said, Moses said that we should write a bill of divorcement. W what do you say? And what did Jesus say? For the hardness of your hearts, he'll, he, he gave, he'll, Moses allowed you to have a bill of divorcement. But it was not that way in the beginning. In other words, God makes provision for people that want to go along with what they want to do. He says, if you're going to do it, this is the way to do it. Okay, but it was not that way in the beginning. It's the same with the diet. God permitted children of Israel to eat meat, but it wasn't that way in the beginning. He gave them quail to eat, and they 
they ended up dying, many of them, with the quail. But it was not the original program. The physiology of man has not changed since Adam. The, the cross didn't baptize pigs to make them more acceptable. It didn't change the physiology of, of the human system. Uh, God permits things and we think it's the best. When we don't realize it's often because of the hardness of man's hearts that he permits things to happen. Uh, there's a book called Blue Zone. Anyone read that? Dave Butner, uh, one of New York best sellers. And uh, it lays out three people groups in the world that have the, the best longevity, healthiest lives. And one was uh, in Okinawa in Japan, one was Sardinia in, uh, it's Greece, isn't it? Sardinia? In Italy, sorry, thank you for correcting me. Italy, and the other one was uh, Loma Linda. Who would have found Loma Linda? <laughs> and they had the longest lifespan. A actually, it was over five years longer than the other two. And it was a study done on Seventh-day Adventists uh, because they have a greater population of Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda. And so they were able to get good data. Actually, the American government spent $6 million studying Seventh-day Adventist lifestyles. And, uh, and we're from all nations, all people groups, right? So this, th this has nothing to do with race. This is to do with dietary habits. And it doesn't mean that all Seventh-day Adventists eat good food. Um, it depends where you go. I've had some, th that's why they call it pot luck. Because sometimes your luck is on the right side. Sometimes it's not so lucky. All right, so um, do you read your labels on the food? We, we covered that, didn't you? Hey, can you tell the difference between these two foods? All right, they're, they're both the same, the French fry and burger. Okay, so the French fry and the burger on the left, that's 10 years old. 10 years old, okay, it's still edible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so listen, it, it, the, the, I think the, the bun got a little dehydrated a bit there, so it's not as filled out, but the fries look the same. Okay, let me tell you something. You have to have life to have decay. You, you get what I'm saying here? So if it doesn't decay, it doesn't have life. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So uh, beware of the golden arches and other like places. Okay, I think it was for rest in peace, wasn't it? Something like that. All right, so living foods produce living people. Dead foods, <laughs> dead people. It's really basic. I try to keep it basic. All right, uh, uh, you, you, you know, it's so hard to find good breakfast food today. If you're looking in the supermarkets, good luck to find any breakfast cereal that doesn't have problems. You know, most of these cereals, they have like 50% sugar. 50% sugar. Yeah, in fact, if you put some of these out to rats, they'll eat the cardboard over the cornflakes. All right, so beware. Uh, this is more like a breakfast that we have. We love berries, it was good to see so many berries lunch today. Berries are very healthy. We eat a lot of blueberries. Uh, we, we love, we get a lot of frozen fruits, strawberries. We love mango. We love raspberries. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a typical uh, breakfast. And we, we have a little bit of, you know, we don't have it dry. We put a little bit of almond milk in there or some, some nice uh, milk to go along with it. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we, we just don't get enough fiber. Now, getting back to fiber, fiber is not just a broom. Fiber helps regulate sugar control. It helps nutrient absorption. It also helps detoxification, 
right? It actually binds to toxins in the body. It can even lower cholesterol. You know, there's no enzyme to lower cholesterol. The only way the body gets rid of cholesterol is through fiber. Okay. So where does cholesterol come from? Anything with a mother, a liver, or a face has cholesterol. All right? A mother, liver, or face has cholesterol. <laughs> okay. All right. What about coconut? Has that got cholesterol? Has it got cholesterol? I'm talking... Yeah. Has it got cholesterol? Has it got a mother, a face, or a liver? No cholesterol. Okay. But, but, what about good cholesterol? Has it got good cholesterol? <laughs> okay, I see the confusion. <laughs> All right, sorry. Uh, you can be misleading by how you express things, right? So it doesn't change. It doesn't have cholesterol, but it does have saturated fats in there. It's over 80% saturated fat in coconut. But that doesn't mean it's got cholesterol, okay? It has medium-chain fatty acids like lauric acid, for example. And we used to live in the Philippines. We had coconut trees all around us. I never saw any fat people climbing for a coconut tree. <laughs> they ate the coconut, didn't get fat. It was amazing. <laughs> all right, what about avocados? Do they have cholesterol? Do they have a face, a mother, liver? No cholesterol. So... This means that Americans, because they're not getting enough cholesterol, sorry, enough fiber, I'm sorry, they get plenty of cholesterol. <laughs> they're not getting a lot of poisons out of their system, right? They're not getting the cleaning broom sweep out. They're not getting uh, sh proper sugar regulation at many times. You know, we used to have uh, diabetics come to Wildwood all the time, and we put them on fruit, and they're like surprised. I can't eat fruit. It's too high in sugar. So you can. Just don't have the fruit juice. You can have the fruit. And they did perfectly fine. Not a problem. Their sugar got back to normal. It was amazing. Uh, gluten. Now, 5% of people have a gluten problem. Okay, so, so we call this celiac disease. It has digestive problems associated with it, especially the small intestines, and it stops the body from absorbing certain nutrients. And uh, this can be a problem. So if you have a reaction, now it's not so much the gluten that's the problem. It's how we process it now. You see the gliadin content, uh, the protein component of the gluten, it is very high. We have changed the way we grow wheat now. We've hybridized things, we've genetically altered things that make it incompatible with human digestion. So uh, just be aware of that. Um, there are lots of good grains out there. I'm, I'm not saying don't eat grains, but uh, there, you don't have to just stick with wheat. You can use barley, you can use get um, good uh, organic corn flour, there's uh, rye flour, there's buckwheat, there's a lot of different flours that are good for you out there that you can use. And grains are the stuff of life. They're, they're just so powerful. Uh, and be careful of, of, of meat products out there. I don't know how meat can get any more disastrous, although just recently it took a new level. Has anyone here seen printed meat? Yeah, there's printed meat now. They've got printers that will, that will make meat. Yes. Print meat out for you. Isn't that wonderful? 
Okay. Yes. Um, be, be, be careful about printed food. Okay. Uh, but there are lots of good foods that we can eat. Lot, look at the, these are some of the superfoods. Aren't they great? Aren't they beautiful colors? Uh, we eat a lot of, let me see what we eat a lot of. We eat a lot of blueberries, we eat a lot of kiwi fruit, we eat a lot of strawberries, oranges, citrus fruit. You've got goji berries there, you've got kale, we eat a lot of that. We eat a lot of broccoli, uh, flaxseed. I don't eat enough flaxseed. We've got walnuts, garlic, the olives. I love olives. I eat olives almost every day in our salad. They're just wonderful foods and very high in good quality oils. Um, in Matthew chapter 4 verse 2 it says Jesus fasted. He fasted 40 days, 40 nights. He was afterwards hungry. Now, why do you think Jesus fasted 40 days? Do we need to fast 40 days? Do you know someone else fasted 40 days? Moses fasted 40 days. And he didn't even have water for 40 days. Now, you can't go four, day, uh, four days at the most maybe without water to survive. But he was actually in the presence of God. So God sustained him. So uh, why I'm bringing this up is because when Jesus started his ministry, he started after he went through a fast for 40 days. And he did that because he wanted man to realize that he uh, suffered the temptations of appetite uh, more than any other human being will be called to endure. And he did that to give us the knowledge that he understands what it's like to go without food, basic necessities. All right, he doesn't call us to 40 days of fasting. In fact, I rarely uh, do I tell people to fast unless they go through a lot of stress and they need a break or they need to, they, they, they're given to appetite, they've abused their digestive uh, system and they may need to have a day off maybe even once a week. Um, but the best fast is actually, if you want to fast every day, you can just skip an, a meal at night. That's why we have the word breakfast, break fast. Yes, most people, they have their breakfast the night before, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We eat a big meal at night and then we wonder why we're not hungry in the morning because that food's still st stuck to our ribs. <laughs> okay. So the best thing to do, you know, my wife, she used to weigh 220 pounds. Uh, she lost 80 pounds uh, in six months just skipping a meal at night. Yeah. And she stayed, stayed the same weight pretty much the whole time we'd been married about 140 pounds. Um, so fasting can be a blessing, okay? If you're gonna fast, do it at night. If you wanna lose some weight, cut out the night meal or just have something light. Have some fruit or uh, maybe popcorn or maybe a juice or even a herbal tea, something like that, and you'll feel much better and you'll have an appetite in the morning. And that will really, really help your digestive system to recover and it will give your chance, uh, your body a chance to uh, restore. Because in fasting, your body actually starts to repair itself. It starts to do a lot of activity that it wouldn't do otherwise if it had constant food in the system. So that's just an added benefit. Uh, in the end, we need to go back to the beginning. Uh, we have a garden at home and uh, my wife, uh, she loves to garden. I, I don't get enough time out there in a the garden. I, I, I need to get more time out there. It's just getting to the end right now. We've just got melons, we've got tomatoes, um, and there's not a lot, lot more work to do out there, but uh, I think 
God wants, especially in the time we're living in, as much as possible to get back to the garden. Because this will help us, not just give us good food, which will be extremely beneficial for us, but also God will talk to us in the garden. I, um, I remember when we were in the Philippines, we, we owned a, a fruit orchard, I think I shared with you last night, and uh, you felt so close to God out in the garden. It's just so many lessons to be learned out there in nature. And this is where uh, Satan's attack is being directed a lot because he knows if he can destroy the quality of the soil, he can destroy the quality of the food, he can also put us in a weak situation biologically. We, we're nutrient deprived, we don't have all the faculties of the mind functioning optimally, and we can be a sitting duck for uh, many uh, disorders. So. Try if you can, if you've got a little spare plot near you, or even in your home. There's people that do gardening in their home. Did you know that? Yeah. You can even do uh, some hydroponics in your house. Uh, it's not the same as putting your hands in the soil. I think that's better. But even so, if you can't do that, there are systems in place where you can actually still have plants growing in your home if you have the right lighting. So. Anyway, my time is uh, up, but I do want to allow some time for questions. So I gave a few minutes for questions. So, you know, the hardest time to give a lecture is after lunch. So I, I didn't want to overextend you. <laughs> so is there any questions? Uh, this was by far, this is not an exhaustive study on nutrition by any means. Um, but... Uh, I wanted to give some simple principles. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, one of the reasons that GMO foods came up was because of trying to keep the weeds down. All right. So, if you use Roundup, which is one of the strongest weed killers, you're going to kill everything, right? You're going to kill all the plants. So what they wanted to do was find a way they could use Roundup without killing the plant. And so they came up with a way they could put some genes, they, they have gene guns where they could actually force the gene, a gene sequence into the seeds to give them resistance to Roundup so that they wouldn't die as a result of being surrounded with Roundup. Okay, and so this genetically altered the chemistry of the seed. And so as a result of that, uh, coming into the body, uh, it's having tremendous impact upon uh, giving rise to cancer. Uh, it's, it's causing mutation, it's causing uh, liver disease, it's causing pancreatic issues, it's causing fertility issues. And so, uh, different people have experienced different symptoms, but it's not good. So the genetically modified foods have ha have their DNA of the seed being changed, and so the impacts affect us physiologically as a result of that. So uh, the benefit is to the farm, but at the same time, the seed, once it's produced, get this, the seed hasn't got the ability to reproduce itself. Hence, the farmer needs to buy the seed every year. So GMO seeds uh, cannot duplicate. So if the seed cannot actually render itself fertile, then what's that going to do to your body? So if we're finding infertility in people who've had genetically modified foods, that's just one thing. There's many other things, but it does accentuate cancer. Anyway, that's the condensed version of it. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you did say that the body will sympathize with the state of the mind and then in return right. the body fixes the mind. But then if, so it kind of has a couple questions Yes. with that. So, so then if you're eating, so the body fixes the mind, right? Because every time you eat the food or before you're 
you're basically, you, like you said, you said you go into shock or you're, you're, you're mentally kind of already broken because you're looking at the food and you're kind of having anxiety over it because right. it's not healthy, et cetera. Yes. Yes. But then in return, you're, the, the food choice that you eat will actually fix the mind. But then how does it fix the mind when, well, how does it fix itself when if you're then cutting out certain things because you want to eat healthy, Yes. but then... How do you get you, to a point where you can have a healthy attitude? Yeah, basically. How do you, how do you get there? Because it yes. seems like a vicious cycle then. It, it does, because you, this is, comes back to education, right? So you have to train the mind. First of all, the food's not going to hurt you. And so you need to know that this is, this is food that God has given us to enjoy and eat, okay? So you have to, I mean, I, I, I know a, a, a fellow, for example, that used to have allergies to bananas. And he, he realized that it was in his mind. And so he started introducing bananas back and he started with a small amount and then he just got more and more. And at first he had some allergic reactions to it and as he kept doing it, he got to the point where he can eat bananas now with no problem. I met another lady. She ate 20 mangoes in one meal. She got an allergic reaction to, to mangoes after that. She couldn't eat mangoes after that. All right. And, and so um, when, you, you, when your mind has caused the problem, you've got to basically educate your mind to the fact that this, this food is is not going to harm me. Now there are certain things that can harm you that could be legit. For example, uh, certain people don't have enzymes to break down beans. All right, and and so that's a physiological thing. And you could think all the positive thoughts you want, but you don't have the chemistry to break down beans. All right, and there's certain people that may have a reaction to a peanut, for example, or a cashew that is legitimate reaction, okay? Uh, so how do you know what is legitimate and what is not legitimate? If you were having, if you developed a reaction to something uh, that you didn't have before, okay, and it wasn't like uh, you introduced something and had a reaction to it, okay, you weren't expecting it. It's something you had before and then all of a sudden you get a reaction to it uh, if your mind has been focused on restricting your diet, then that's usually an indicator that it's mind-related, that your mind has programmed your stomach to reject that because of anxiety. Okay, so the key is to know yourself. And do I have anxiety over eating this food? And it comes back to knowing that you're eating in good faith because you're, there's nothing unhelpful that is what you're eating, right? So it's not like you're eating a chocolate cake and you get a stomach uh, reaction or eating a big bowl of ice cream or something and you know that this isn't the best for me and now you're saying, mind, I want you to like this ice cream. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. All right, but if you're eating things that God has given us and you're having anxiety over that and you have reaction to that, then you may want to start reevaluating is this something that I'm perpetuating through my anxiety? So, so you've got to retrain your mind. And sometimes it's best to start off with eating something in small amounts or even getting someone to hide that food in your food so that it tricks your mind that you don't even know you're eating it, right? Then if you have a reaction to it when someone's hiding your food and that you don't know, then it's probably an indicator you've got some type of allergic reaction to it. I don't know if that completely answered that question for you, but those those are some suggestions I would. Could a I good example use. of could a good example of that Lee, be um, what we've been taught? Okay, what yes. we think is true. Right. In other words, counting calories. Oh or yes. Or perhaps. Yes. Um, Oh, the apple has seeds that have arsenic in them. Oh dear, yes. you know, yes, freak yes, out, yes. right? So, yes. I think maybe an example of that would be it what's been input that's not true. Th that definitely can and help. And that causes yes. anxiety. I know for myself, Yes. the minute I said, forget it, I'm not counting calories, I'm just eating what's healthy. 
it, it all yes. went away. I yes. mean, the, the weight falls off and, you know, you just get healthy. Yes, so. yeah, that's, that's a good point. In fact, uh, much of what you learn at, at school and your study as a dietitian is calorie restriction, counting calories and looking at what's higher in calories than this. And, and it's really bad for the mind. We're not to weigh our food. We're not to, look, if you, if you chew your food well, you're not in a hurry because eating fast can cause you to eat too much because the stretch receptors on the stomach Take, uh, take a while to notify your hypothalamus of the uh, quantity of food you've eaten, give you a sense of satiety. And so uh, if you chew your food well, then you can get a, uh, your body will indicate to you when you've had enough. All right, so the Holy Spirit will actually tell you when to stop. It's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to tell you when to stop. All right, and he does that. Have you noticed that? He tells you <laughs> when to stop. So don't worry about calories. And yeah, don't, don't weigh your food. And enjoy. Eating is one of the best things of life, right? Yes. So I had a question about soy. I, I feel like there's a lot of discrepancy behind soy and if it's good for you. I yes. know you had brought up the blue zones and I know the Okinawas have a lot of tofu in their diet, but then if you look up soy, there's a lot of stuff that they say is bad for you, so I'm kind of interested in your take yes. on soy products. Yes, okay, good question. I'm glad you brought it up. Yes, so there's four main problems that can occur from soy. There's over 400 negative studies on soy, clinical studies on soy, and they usually fall in one of four categories. One, GMO soy. Two, soy isolates. Three, improperly cooked soybeans, or four, uh, eating too, too many, okay? So, uh, now so there are some people, we could put a fifth category, that's a rarer category, but some people don't have the digestive capacity to break down soybean. Uh, but if you eat soy in moderation, uh, you eat the whole soybean, it's from non-GMO soy, um, properly cooked, and you don't have any problems, then it's more than likely do you more good than harm. So yes, there's a lot of negativity of soy, but it um, doesn't mean that we throw out the baby with the bathwater. So as far as uh, tofu goes, tofu is a more refined product, okay? Now, when I was in Japan, I lived in Japan two years. I was one year in Tokyo. Um, <laughs> I had these students, they would take me out to a restaurant. One time they took me out to a tofu restaurant and everything was tofu. There was tofu soup, there was tofu ice cream, tofu, what else was there? You ate a block of tofu, you know, like that was the main course. And it was the first time in my life I heard my kidneys screaming at me. <laughs> so you, you definitely can't overdo the soy my son, if he's watching, he loves tofu, and he would rather eat it. If he could, he could eat it every day, but we're trying to restrict him. Um, there are some uh, protective elements against certain types of cancer. Now, some doctors will say don't eat soy because it could exacerbate or make breast cancer accelerate. There's no evidence for that. In fact, the soy... Uh, the estrogen in soy is a phytoestrogen. It protects you against cancer, and it binds with estrogen receptors to outblock those fake estrogens like xenoestrogens, oestrogens, synthetic estrogens that can actually cause the development of cancer. So um, soy is, is good in moderation, and the least refined, the better. Thank you for that question. So when you said... Whole, the whole soybean, yes, right? So correct. you're talking edamame, yes. tempeh. Right. Where would you say the tofu block falls? The tofu block, okay. <laughs> well, I'll just say <laughs> just this. Just being specific. <laughs> yes. On the tail end, but I'll say this, temperance is an individual matter. So we don't have seven soybeans a day, three almonds a day, 500 calories of edamame, <laughs> whatever. 
<laughs> we, yes, that's why God doesn't mark things out too definitively. Soy milk, it, it depends. If it's from whole soybeans, you can make a healthy soy milk. Yes. Okay. Yes, um, Mary Lou. I'm not sure how to ask this question, but <laughs> what are they doing to our foods today? To the some what? Some of the packaging you're now seeing, some labeling that we've never seen before. Oh, are you talking about a peel? Uh, uh, that's one of them, but the other thing with the insects and do you know anything about that? And with the insects, you okay? Do you mean in presentation, or do you mean spraying on? Oh yes, yes, that's right. Yes, well, you have to be very careful about that. Yes, I would avoid anything that says bioengineered on it. Yes, I would definitely avoid that. Yes, right. Yeah, I agree with that. Yes, sir. So you did not touch on this, but I'm still going to ask you anyway. Sorry, hopefully you have a vast knowledge that you didn't even get a chance to share with us. Um, what causes triglycerides to go up and what can mm -hmm. you do to get them to go back down? Okay, good question. Well, certainly uh, triglycerides can go up through dietary habits, especially sugars, and, and in particular refined sugars. Now, stress can also elevate triglycerides as well. In fact, um, it can also elevate cholesterol levels. I've had uh, a number of vegans that have high levels of cholesterol and they tell me emphatically I don't eat any animal products I don't don't take any cholesterol in any form and they have high cholesterol levels because of stress because when you're stressed your body makes more cholesterol because it's used to make stress hormones so the liver is making more stress and it's the same with triglycerides because stress elevates cortisol also affects glucocorticoids that release sugar into the body and excess sugar can end up triglycerides. So, yeah, it's the same thing. So, I'd say stress, yes, lower stress and be careful of excess refined carbohydrates. I don't know, who's got the mic? Oh, it's back there, <laughs> okay. Uh, anyone else had a question? Any other questions? Going once. You kind of run out of questions. <laughs> oh, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm trying to be concise because I thought there was going to be dozens, dozens of questions, so I kept it short. <laughs> and maybe there wasn't. <laughs> All right. A young man at the back, he's got a question? Oh, no, you're just putting the mic away. Okay, well, listen, if you have any more questions, I'll be happy to, I'll be hanging around for a little bit, so feel free to ask. And uh, I hope you can come back tomorrow. We'll be talking about the botanical medicines and um, how that impacts disease and how that can assist us to get back on track. So please come, bring a friend. It's, uh, it's free. Uh, there's no, no one at the door going to take any money from you, but um, you're welcome to bring a friend, bring a neighbor, bring anyone you want, and uh, we'll be meeting here, uh, I think it's 2.30, two, two okay, so 2.30 to, is it 2, what's that? Oh, I'll be here, yeah, I'll be here earlier. Oh, yeah, I'll be bringing some herbs if anyone needs it. So, uh, hey, thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of today. And, um, Pastor, do you want to close us out with a word of prayer? Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I was traveling from Lake Syria, so I got the tail end of it, but it was really good. And I know how many are looking forward to tomorrow, especially when you get some herbs and put to practice some of the things you've been learning. Fantastic. 
And so there's a couple little things here. One other thing that we wanted to mention, I know some might not have been here earlier, but we're having uh, on October 2nd, a Discovering Revelation. It's a program. We're diving into Bible prophecy and answering the big questions we have in life. Uh, why are we here? What is our purpose? What is God's plan? Understanding what's happening in this world. And uh, we're talking about that as we see things in our food we're trying to understand. But some of the deeper questions, we want to take a look at about prophecy. And so that will be at the American Spirit Center just down the road from here, October 2nd at 7 p.m. But uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you for what we learned this afternoon. And Lord, there's so much that you've given us in nature. Well, it shouldn't be a surprise to us, for you created it for a purpose, not just for beauty, not just to admire, not just the colors, but for nutrients and to be used for us in a blessing in a positive way. Help us, Father, not to be overly concerned, but rather, Father, with that knowledge, use it to harness the foods that you've given us, the herbs that you've given us, and apply them to our own lives that we might have life and life more abundantly. As Jesus says, may this be our experience in Jesus' name. Amen.